Hey y'all, Coach in the Fight here. Got a shadow man with me. And we are looking at Ezekiel chapter 20 today in today's class. I just wanted to uh, come out here and introduce um, this class um, talking about Ezekiel. Um, it's um, a class that pertains to the uh, 10th of Av. We'll see here, and that's why we're doing it. We're approaching the tenth of Av, and as we were getting the scriptures ready for other classes, um, we came across this Ezekiel chapter twenty, the entire chapter. And so, what we want to do is we want to dedicate um, this uh, video to that entire chapter as it relates to um, the tenth day of Av, Asari. Um, be of uh, or you know whatever you want to call it so we're looking at Ezekiel chapter 20 and it starts off let me go ahead and read verse 1 it says and it came to pass in the seventh year in the fifth month the tenth day of the month that certain of the elders of Israel came to inquire of the Lord and sat before me now, if you thought that I was going to read about the destruction of the temple, then that's my fault because, you know, I said it was, you know, related. But you hear here what's actually going on is you have these elders, these, you know, these will be your ministers. These would be the people who would otherwise stand in front of us and tell us um, what thus saith the Lord have now gone in and are inquiring um, at Ezekiel's hand there. So here are the elders of Israel who are come to Ezekiel to inquire of the Lord. So now there they are sitting by his feet. Then came the word of the Lord unto me, saying, Son of man, speak unto the elders of Israel, and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Are ye come to inquire of me? As I live, saith the Lord God, I will not be inquired of by you. So here we are on the tenth day of the fifth month. This is the fast of the fifth month. And you have these elders who are come to the prophet now. That's part of what we ought to understand is that um, they are the elders of the community, leaders of the community. But, you know, they're sitting at the feet of this prophet, Ezekiel, inquiring about the Lord. They want to know about the Lord all of a sudden and... This prophet is about to do what prophets do, and that's receive a word directly from the spirit world. And what it tells them is, is that I'm not going to be inquired of by you. Verse 4 says, Wilt thou judge them, son of man? Wilt thou judge them? Cause them to know the abominations of their fathers? See, this is what makes this important is because we have to understand the abominations of our fathers that's what the problem is it's not that we are bad people you look at the way the earth is now and all this going on well if you approach any individual and talk to them you'll find that the majority of the people on the planet have you know good hearts they they, they have good intentions so we're not wicked people. We're not bad people. But it was our forefathers that committed these abominations. And now we are living it out. It's like, imagine if there was something that your forefather could have did that would have made you mentally or physically ill. Like if he ate a certain food you would grow up with three heads or something like that because he ate that certain food or did that certain thing and now here you are uh with no toes you know 
can clearly blame your forefather for your missing toes. But, you know, there's really nothing you can do about it. You can't grow toes. Well, in this case, where it's talking about the abominations of our fathers, he's talking about them breaking the law. And so in this case, we can actually do something about it. We can actually correct ourselves. But anyway, that's another story. Verse 5 says, And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, In the day when I chose Israel, and lifted up mine hand unto the seed of the house of Jacob, and made myself known unto them in the land of Egypt. When I lifted up mine hand unto them, saying, I am the Lord God, in the day that I lifted up mine hand unto them to bring them forth of the land of Egypt into the land that I had expired for them, flowing with milk and honey, which is the glory of all lands. See, he's talking about this people. He saved these two million people out of Egypt. Just went into Egypt with these outstretched arms. We're going to hear about these eagles wings. And he carried these two million people out of Egypt and brought them into the wilderness. But what he's talking about specifically here is the day that he chose them it's like okay this day was the decision made that we're going to choose this particular two million people and we're going to make them the chosen seed on that day that he reached out his hand to them is what he's talking about here verse 7 says then said i unto them cast ye away every man the abominations of his eyes and defile not yourselves with the idols of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So now the way I understand this, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong down in the comment section, but he's saying the big picture, the big point of this is on that day that he told that he chose Israel in Egypt, he told them to put away these abominations of their eyes. Um, it says, defile yourselves, uh, not with these idols do not defile yourself with these idols this is day one is what i'm understanding this this is the big picture of these few verses here's the connection between this day and this most important verse here or this most important commandment i should say to avoid idols and we hear about that all through the scripture every time we start hearing about commandments one of the first things we hear about is idols and you know how important it is to not be involved or you know um defiled by these idols verse 8 says but they rebelled against me and would not hearken unto me they did not every man cast away the abominations of their eyes Neither did they forsake the idols of Egypt. Then I said, I will pour out my fury upon them to accomplish my anger against them in the midst of the land of Egypt. So here we are talking about these idols. We're talking about the 10th day of Av. We're talking about the day that the father left us or brought us out of Egypt, which was a Passover day. And he's talking about these idols here and how when he asked them, and I want to say us, so I'm going to say when he asked us to put away these idols and these images of Egypt, we rebelled against them and we didn't put them away. Well, you look at us now and we're doing the same thing, especially when you consider that the idols of Egypt now would be stuff like television. The idols would be stuff like money. You know, anything with the image that we read about in Exodus chapter 20, um, when it comes to the images and the idols, when we look around our household, the question is, do we see these? You know, do we, do we see these images? And a lot of us do, I do. You know, I'm not going to sit here and act like if you went through my home right now, you're not going to find an image, especially if you look in books and stuff. You know, they're definitely in the books, but there may be, 
you know, something I'm missing, something that's out of sight that you could uncover that would have, you know, an image of a of a, a idol, uh, you know, there on it. Um, my point is not that I'm here to judge anybody. Um, I want to say that I'm in the same boat with everybody else, but I believe it's important to bring this out, even though we're all guilty of it, even though um, we are swimming in idolatry like a fish swimming in water. With this verse, I believe, chapter 20, talking about the fifth day or the tenth day of the fifth month is extremely significant. Um, so we really need to hearken onto this message because he says, if we don't, he says he will pour out his fury upon us. He said, this is what happened before to accomplish my anger against them in the midst of the land of Egypt. Verse nine says, but I wrought for my namesake that it should not be polluted before the heathen among whom they were in whose sight I made myself known unto them and bringing them forth out of the land of Egypt. So he wants to make a distinction between his name and what the people have been experiencing in Egypt. You could imagine, you know, how open armed they were when they welcomed Israel in. And so while they were embracing Israel, Israel would have been embracing them. And so they would have quickly learned the culture of the Egyptians. But they're being asked to put all of that stuff away. But notice this part. He says, Wherefore I caused them to go forth out of the land of Egypt and brought them into the wilderness. Okay, so here he is making a connection between the 10th day of the fifth month and Passover. Now, I'm not sure of what the significance of this connection is, but it's definitely here in this, in this verse here because all of what he's talking about is about Passover. And then in the, in a verse 11, he's talking about uh, Pentecost there, but it says, and I gave them my statutes and showed them my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. So this is the way, the path that he's referring to right now. We did a video not too long ago talking about the way, I think we called it the way, but the way to the kingdom of heaven is through our Messiah. You ever wonder how is it that the Messiah died for our sins? What is it about his blood that is, is, does something for our salvation? Well, it's the fact that he turned his blood into wine. And when we take the communion festival, um, we actually get cleansed. And I've even, you know, skipped the part. And that's the most important part. And that's baptism, which I say once again, he turned his blood into water. And whereas before you had to have the blood to of a, of a lamb to, to, to cleanse away your sins and purify you. Now that the Messiah has died and shed his blood, turning it into this water of baptism, we can now be baptized and cleansed of the stains on our spirit, even in our previous lifetimes. And then after that, even though we still make mistakes and, you know, everybody, everybody say everybody's a sinner. We all are sinners. Well, after we get baptized, we then have Passover every year. Every year we get a clean slate through Passover to partake of the wine. Then after that, especially when we're new around Pentecost time is when we receive the law, the statutes, the judgments, the covenants and um, all of this. And I'm keep flashing up videos, hopefully that you guys can link to after you come back and watch this video again. You can click on these links that will show um, the connections between what we're reading here and the way this this way, you know, this pattern that we see that involves people like Noah, Abraham, Jacob, uh, Moses, the Messiah, the disciples, um, you know, and every just about everybody else in, in Scripture where you hear stories. Not so much the prophets. They, they, they were a little different. Verse 12 says, Moreover also I gave them my Sabbaths 
to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctify them. Now, one would argue that, you know, this is a, you know, been a bit of a conflict between some other scripture. I think it's the book of Jasher that shows clearly that the people received the Sabbath day first. They got it first before they ever was led out of Egypt. They they were in Egypt, and even before the plagues came down, um, they were keeping a Sabbath day, you know, because of some divine intervention between Moses and Pharaoh um, that you read there in the book of Jasher. So I think that lends to the importance of the Sabbath day in all of this. You know, we was talking about the way earlier. Well, if you don't know to keep a Sabbath day, you will defile your way immediately. Now, getting the day right is not 100% of importance. It is important because of, you know, chapter 46, verse 1 in the book of Ezekiel. But, you know, keeping a Sabbath day never, ever work seven days in a row. Um, this is a sign between me and them. But this, this is a, a this is a, you hear about the, the mark of the beast. Well, somebody who had, who worked seven days in a row doesn't have the mark or the sign of the father. And so if they don't have the sign of the father, it is possible, you know, that they have the sign or the mark of the beast. The reason why I say that, because you really can't have two marks or two signs um you can't have both the mark of the beast and the mark of the um um the father at the same time you know but anyway it notice right here this important part where it says that they might know that i am the lord that sanctify them anybody who has a problem with the father or the law or the scripture or anything like that it's because they don't keep the sabbath day you know if they're in a comment section and they're you know saying you know they disagree they don't feel like this is right they don't feel like that is right just ask them do you keep a sabbath day and when they say no they don't keep a sabbath day, you ain't really got to say nothing else they ain't gonna understand you know you don't really understand until you start keeping a sabbath day it's my point Verse 13 says, but the house of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness. They walked not in my statutes and they despised my judgments, which if a man do, he shall even live in them. And my Sabbaths, they greatly polluted. Then I said, I will pour out my fury upon them in the wilderness to consume them. So here we're hearing about this 40 years. These people spent 40 years out there until they actually perished. It was like that was the purpose of this 40 years was so that every grown person that walked out of Egypt was perished and didn't get the chance to walk into the promised land. The only people that got to see the promised land that actually walked out of Egypt as a grown person, he was a young man was Joshua and maybe Caleb were the only two. Everybody else, Moses, Aaron, everybody else that was an adult perished during this 40 years that he's talking about where he poured out his fury on them. But anyway, verse 14 says, but I wrought for my namesake that it should not be polluted before the heathen in whose sight I brought them out. So, he separated us from these people that he didn't want to commit the pollutions. So you got to understand that faith in the father, that service to the father. I'm trying to find out what was a good word here um, that actually makes you choose him over the world is whatever you want to call it. It's very weak. And in a lot of cases, it tells us that we have to separate ourselves from the people of the world or they will not I don't want to say defile or pollute us you know or anything like that but they will change who we are like for instance if you allow your child to marry a gentile who keeps pagan holidays it won't be long that your child will be keeping pagan holidays I don't care if you raise them keeping Christmas or not you know, show up unannounced on Christmas at their doorstep and you are going to see lights and, and you know, hopefully you don't see a tree, but you're going to see 
presents and you're going to see food and you're going to see, you know, Christmas. You're going to see that stuff around. And it's hard to go the other way around if your child who tries to convert them over and say, no, we're going to we're not going to keep Christmas. We're going to keep tabernacles instead. Well, then it's going to be a huge fight. I mean, a physical, you know, somebody going to jail, you know, before it's over with, you know, or worse, because it's going to get really rough around that house when these two people who are so different are at odds one wants to keep the pagan holiday and one wants to keep the holy holiday the, the holy days and they're there they are um at war it, it's okay it, it, the household would be okay and everything would be fine if the holy child acquiesced and says you know we okay i'm not going to worry about it we're going to do it your way then the family will be fine they will be seem successful everything will be going well you know there'll be a beautiful postcard family you know when they do it the pagan person's way but when that child says no we're gonna keep it holy well yeah holy means war holy means, holy means war like the messiah said he didn't come to bring peace he came to bring a sword so I believe that's what verse 14 is talking about. Verse 15 says, yet also I lift up my hand unto them in the wilderness that I will not bring them into the land which I had given them flowing with milk and honey, which is the glory of all lands. So he's not going to allow them to come in. He's not going to allow these adults who walked out of Egypt to enter the promised land. Only their children will be able to enter this promised land. He says, because they despised my judgments and walked not in my statutes and polluted my Sabbaths for their heart went after their idols. See, now that's where we started off at, right? In this conversation, you know, that's why we spent so much time talking about that because he is now saying this is the reason behind all of these other difficulties was because of these idols. Day one, he told us to put away these idols. We rebelled against them and we didn't. And here now, we're not going to be able to see the promised land because of these idols, because of these images and stuff. Well, that's what makes this this important. Nevertheless, mine eyes spared them from destroying them. Neither did I make an end of them in the wilderness. So he didn't kill everybody. He could have destroyed everybody and made them start over. You know, I told you to put away those images of Egypt. I told you to put away those idols. I told you to get rid of that stuff and you didn't. So now we're going to start over. Like you told Moses, you know, just step out of the way. I'll find another 2 million people to lead out of an Egypt, Egyptian type environment and put them in the wilderness for a while. And I will teach them my statutes, my judgments and my commandments. And we'll see if they will separate themselves from their idols. But I said unto their children in the wilderness, walk ye not in the statues of your fathers, neither observe their judgments, nor defile yourselves with their idols. So here he is talking to my children now, if this were a similar case. I'm the one walked out of Egypt. And so he's talking to my kids and he's saying, don't do this. Don't, don't partake in their idolatry put keep that stuff away and i believe it's important to focus on the kids because they didn't grow up with it you know i grew up watching television i grew up using money i grew up you know looking at pictures of family members on the wall and all kinds of stuff that it will fall under this category but a brand new child you know especially after the so-called day of the Lord and most of this idolatry has been cleansed away with the rest of the materialism, then these children will actually get it. And, you know, they'll be the ones who will go into this so-called millennial age. I mean, there's nothing saying that we can't go, but the focus is always, always, always on the children, always. So, He's telling the children, don't walk and don't do what your fathers did. Don't 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 do their commandments and they don't listen to them. 
So here is some more of that war that we were talking about earlier when you have these children looking at their parents saying, no, I'm not doing that, mom. I'm not, you know, I'm not doing that, dad. I'm going to take the Sabbath day off. I'm not going to do that. Verse 19 says, I am the Lord your God. Walk in my statutes and keep my judgments and do them. So there, there's a big distinction. And there was then and there is now a big distinction between what's right in the eyes of Egypt and what's right in the eyes of the commandments of, of the scripture, of the, the, the law of the Messiah. Um, there's a huge difference. So he's saying, walk in his commandments and hallow my Sabbaths and they shall be a sign between me and you that ye may know that I am the Lord your God. Now, is this deja vu or did we talk about this already about this Sabbath being a sign? This is extremely important stuff. And, you know, I believe he's given us the example here of the children leaving Egypt and relating it to some futuristic event, especially when you think about how these fast days are supposed to become uh, days of celebration, cheerful feasts and days of joy, you start to see that there's a big connection between the Sabbath days and this idolatry in here and, you know, our father leading us It's like this is the most important thing about it all is sabbath days and idolatry you know he really hasn't talked about much else he said words like statutes and judgments but he hasn't named anything other than you know sabbaths and idolatry that i can remember we can look back up there but right now let's look at verse 21 he says nevertheless the children rebelled against me they walked not in my statutes, neither kept my judgments to do them, which if a man do, he shall even live in them. They polluted my Sabbaths. Then I said, I will pour out my fury upon them to accomplish my anger against them in the wilderness. 22 says, nevertheless, I will withdraw mine hand and wrought my namesake that it should not be polluted in the sight of the heathen in whose sight I brought them forth. So to me, this sounds like he is being merciful here with us and that he keeps removing his hand and or taking his name away from us because, I mean, otherwise it will be polluted by the heathen. So to me, this sounds like there's separation here. But anyway, look at verse 23. It says, I lifted up mine hand unto them also in the wilderness that I would scatter them among the heathen and disperse them to the countries. Okay. So no, he's lifting up his hand to actually scatter them and disperse them to the other lands because they had not executed my judgments, but had despised my statutes and had polluted my Sabbaths and their eyes were after their father's idols. So here you have this people who have been led out of Egypt wanting to keep the Egyptian ways of doing stuff, even down to the idols. Some of the stuff may have been OK, you know, as long as it really didn't break the rules or the covenant. You know, you could do some you, know, you could do some stuff. I mean, we have a little basketball court out there right now and I don't see a problem if my children were to pop up and go out there and play a game of hoops or whatever. But there's other stuff that we had to leave behind in Egypt and we were told to. And looks like that really the only thing we were told to leave behind was the idolatry. You know, we were actually to start keeping the Sabbath days. But as far as what we weren't supposed to do, you know, the idolatry was the number one thing that we're hearing about here. And these statutes and judgments are not too far behind. But we wanted our father's idols, and that was the problem. Verse 25 says, Wherefore I gave them also statutes that were not good, and judgments whereby they should not live. So you say, what? Huh? So he has now given us statutes that are not good, or that were not good, and judgments whereby they should not live, and polluted them in their own gifts. And that they caused to pass through the fire all that openeth the wound, that I might make them desolate to the end that they might know that I am the Lord. 
So this is what, you know, a lot of those people who will come out and say that, you know, our father is good as well as bad, you know, they say that he's, he can do bad stuff. But you have to understand the difference between our father and this word Lord here. This word Lord here is talking about Elohim, which refers to all things in the spirit world, including the angel of death that went through and dispatched all of those firstborn children. So when you're reading this and it's given statutes that were not good, that's like, well, something my wife and I were talking about, I think it was yesterday or maybe even today, that there were some of the rules that were given to Moses that were misunderstood. And when he says that he will give them statutes that were not good, I have to question who else was receiving these so-called statutes besides Moses. But anyway, we'll save that one for another class or at least the comment section. Let's talk about this one down in the, in the comment section. But let's go on. It says they caused all of the firstborn children to be sacrificed. So now a lot of people will talk about this. Uh, and that they were doing here and related to abortion. And when you look at how usually when somebody commits on an abortion, it's usually the young lady's first child, the opening the womb part. And so if I believe if you did a poll down there and who was actually committing abortions, I believe you would have more first time mothers down there than anybody else. And so that's what this whole thing was when they were get, having these children to pass over to Molech is that they were actually throwing these children into the fire. You had this this idol figure who was um, had his arms out as if he was trying to catch this um whatever was thrown whatever was thrown to it but it was an idol so of course it wasn't going to move and when you threw whatever you was going to throw into the hands of this thing it actually just passed through his hands and lasted in, into the fire so now i personally believe that what's going on here is satan is actually killing the firstborn males the levi's that you know we always talk about on our channel this is the disposal of these firstborn children not only now but back then as well now there is another camp that talks about you know masonry and how that may have something to do with you know this fire that they're talking about here but i don't know much about any of all of that so let's go on it says therefore son of man speak unto the house of israel and say unto them thus saith the lord god yet in this your fathers have blasphemed me and that they have committed a trespass against me. So now we're turning blasphemous. You know, it's like a, a progression here. Um, that's just part of it. When you see somebody that's, that's blasphemous, you, you know, they're pretty much at a point of no return at that point. You know, there's really no coming back from that. Verse 28 says, for when I had brought them into the land for the which I lifted up my hand to give it to them, then they saw every high hill and all the thick trees and they offered their their sacrifices and they presented their provocation of their offering there also they made their sweet savior and poured out their drink offerings. So here, all of this, I mean, sounds good, but when we look back at verse 27, somehow these people, somehow we are, or we did blaspheme him and all of these, you know, high hills and thick trees, you know, making these offerings and these sacrifices. Obviously, there was a problem with that. Let's see if we can find out what it is. It says, did I said unto him, what is the high place where unto ye go? And the name whereof is called Bema unto this day. And it might be Bama. But wherefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord, Are ye polluted after the manner of your fathers, and commit ye whoredom after their abominations? So now what this is talking about is breaking the law. I mean, we would want to hope that it involves something that we are not doing, but that just ain't the case. You know, 
sure stuff like murder and um, other stuff is part of the law. Um, but there's other elements that we are uh, breaking, particularly like what we're talking about here, the Sabbath day and idolatry, you know, I mean, you're on YouTube now. We're on YouTube. I'm on YouTube. I watch YouTube, you know, too. And that's a form of idolatry, you know, same as, you know, like a Facebook would be idolatry. Um, anything that's showing you all of these images of people and dogs and cats and all of that kind of stuff is what he's talking about here when he's talking about these idols and these images and these abominations of our fathers and whatnot. He wants us to put those away. Wherefore well, say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, Are ye polluted after the manner of your fathers, and commit ye whoredoms after their abominations? And by whoredoms, their whoredoms after their abominations is talking about feast days, like you know, keeping the the um that's what fornicate means when you're fornicating in the bible biblical form fornication is talking about participating with pagan gods you call yourself um a servant of the most high you call yourself a disciple you call yourself a christian you call yourself you know whatever you say you you say you you serve and worship the most high but as soon as christmas come around you're gonna go over there and you're gonna play with them for a while and then christmas come back go away you're gonna come back over here and you're going to um act like you know you didn't just go over there and fornicate with that other god that's the way it is you know it's like when your other boyfriend come around well that's the same thing when the mother feast days come around all of those feast days are associated with gods and we worship god 300 days out of the year but then every once in a while a lowercase g god comes around and we jump in his truck and go ride with him play with him do what he want us to do and then he drop us back off at the end of his uh holiday and we come back with the with the father that's that's what he means by whoredom. We're whoring around. Verse 31 says, For when ye offer your gifts, when ye make your sons to pass through the fire, ye pollute yourselves with all your idols, even unto this day. And shall I be inquired of by you, O house of Israel? As I live, saith the Lord, I will not be inquired of by you. Okay, so he's talking about our idolatry and they're not keeping up these Sabbath days. You know, this is very serious business here. This is why, you know, people have a hard time understanding spirituality, you know, because, you know, they've been cut off. Not keeping a Sabbath day gets you cut off. Idolatry gets you cut off. Um, and so now you don't really have this relationship. You know, there's a lot of people who are religious now. Don't get me wrong. You know, they can sound religious. They can dress up every Sunday. They can even stand behind a pulpit and preach a sermon. But, you know, that doesn't mean that they have a spiritual connection. And whenever you see a bunch of idolatry around or a person not keeping the Sabbath day and, and, and such, you can be assured that it's just a religion and there's not going to be any spirituality around until something changes and they start to reject and get back on a path at least is what i believe you know we ain't seen nothing about that in this in this chapter so maybe he's actually going to talk about that all he's talking about right now is how you know he's not going to listen to us you know verse 32 says and and i guess one of, the, one of the things about that is he doesn't allow us to understand the correct way to pray. And so now that we don't know how to pray, then we don't know how to communicate with him. And so he doesn't have to ignore us. You know, it's like when, you know, they don't have your phone number. You ain't got to ignore them. They don't they don't know how to call you anyway. And that which cometh into your mind shall not be at all that ye say we will be as the heathen, as the families of the countries to serve wood and stone the new international version says ye say we want to be like the nations like the peoples of the world who serve wood and stone but what ye have in mind shall never happen so you're not going to be able to abandon the father's ways altogether you're not going to be on be able to uncircumcise yourself and live your life as if you was a heathen from now on 
Verse 33 says, As I live, saith the Lord, surely with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm and with fury poured out will I rule over you. So the thing about being outside of our Father's laws and commandments is it causes tribulation and causes pain for us. You know, um, sure, you could break the commandments all you want to. OK, but now go live out there in the wilderness. You know what I'm saying? Go go out there in nature for a little while. See how long you last. You know what I mean? Um, it's, you, you, the mosquitoes going to bite all of us because all of us got stuff going on. But for some of us, there's a whole lot worse stuff out there than a mosquito. You know what I mean? So we have to be careful and not think so much that it is our father who is causing this. The Elohim, this Lord individual they keep talking about has a lot to do with it the elohim has a lot to do with it but when it comes to our father we have to remember that he is like a father to us he wouldn't actually do anything to harm us you know what i mean um you know if i had the power this you know my son can do whatever he wants to do out there you know where he's at and you know there's nothing he can do that's going to make me hit him with a bolt of lightning you know that's just not going to happen and that's the same way our father is you know but having a certain level of maturity like any daddy does our father um understands the dangers of doing wrong things and so he tries to encourage us to do the right thing and so i believe that's what he's talking about here where he says and i will bring them out from the people and will gather them out of the countries wherein ye are scattered with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm and with fury poured out. So now you think of the progression of this. You can actually write this out when we were talking about the way earlier. OK, well, now you're going to have, you know, all of this that you can add to the way we can see you come out into the wilderness and he um, tries to separate us from our idolatry and from not keeping the Sabbath day. And those, of course, there'll be some that'll do right, but then the others will be scattered and kind of put in cities and such. And then even there he comes and he gets us and he brings us back out, um, you know, and tries again to teach us the laws and the statutes is what it boils down to is the laws, the statutes, the commandments, the judgments. This is gets real interesting when you look at this in light of what you read about over in the book of Daniel in chapter 12 and that scattering that you see over there and how it's supposed to come to an end um, right at a certain period that I'm going to say we're just close to that time when it's supposed to come to an end. You can watch some of those other videos on that. But look at verse 35. It says, and I will bring you into the wilderness of the people and there I will plead with you face to face. Now, keep noticing this wilderness and how it plays a part in this even to the point where you look in the book of revelation and you look futuristically and the people will once again go into the wilderness this wilderness is, is a huge thing and when you look at the other words the synonyms for the word wilderness um it really gets interesting because you, you understand that it's talking no more than about the country you being in egypt which is the city and what's the opposite of the city is the country so that's what it's talking about um woods could be talking about desert land it's just away from the egyptian stuff like pavement and cars and buildings and you know all of that stuff going on um i was working on a video um about my house and how the father led us to this particular property but the thing about it is in the wilderness we are now in the wilderness whereas before we were in a urban environment now we're in a wilderness like as i pleaded with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of egypt so will i plead with you saith the lord so you have this way here this 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 pattern of things many of us are in this wilderness state and the father is uh pleading with us at this moment and this is definitely a connection between um Passover, like we said, and the 10th of Av. That's interesting that there's some type of connection. I'm not sure I understand what it is exactly yet, but there's definitely, you know, a lot of talk about Passover on this particular um, event, which is all about the 10th day of the fifth month. 
37 says, and I will cause you to pass under the rod and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. So this is, you know, again, referring back to the book of Revelation in chapter 12. This is what's going on when we're out there in this wilderness for, you know, these many days is that he's bringing us into the bond of his covenant. You can read over in the book of, you know, the third testament of the Bible, where it talks about when these people who are chosen by him find themselves reunited around the, his law. Then the elements are going to show signs. It talks about earthquakes and uh, meteor showers and different stuff going on. Um when this happens here after this wilderness period that we hear about in the book of revelation but anyway um i think this goes beyond that into you know this complete pattern and you know the way it happens you know anytime like verse 38 that says and i will purge out from among you the rebels and them that transgress against me and I will bring them forth out of the country where they sojourn and they shall not enter into the land of Israel and ye shall know that I am the Lord. So these people, you know, speaking materialistically, a lot of times you will have people who will move back here to this wilderness area. We see them move back here all the time. As for you, O house of Israel, thus saith the Lord God, go ye serve ye every one his idols and hereafter also if ye will not hearken unto me but pollute ye my holy name no more with your gifts and with your idols so if we're going to continue on this path if we're going to continue doing this it says for in mine holy mountain in the mountain of the height of israel saith the lord god there shall all the house of israel all the house of the land serve me there will I accept them, and there will I require your offering and the first fruits of your oblations with all your holy things. All right, once again, I'm going to come over to the New International Version that says, As for you, people of Israel, this is what the sovereign Lord says Go and serve your idols, every one of you, but afterwards you will surely listen to me and no longer profane my holy name with your gifts and idols. Okay, so that makes sense. You doing it now, but you're not going to do it forever. And it says, for on my holy mountain, the high mountain of Israel declares the sovereign Lord. There in the land, all the people of Israel will serve me and there I will accept them. There I will require your offerings and your choice gifts along with all your sacrifices. Okay, so this, you know, things are going to change is what it's saying. You know, he's never really going to give up on us and allow us to, you know, go completely over to um, the other side, never looking back. You could imagine if this wasn't the case, that would be exactly what would happen. Um, Satan would definitely win because, you know, we would, we would never really find the path back to him there's no way really for us to do it alone so he reaches in and he grabs us and he puts us on this right path verse 41 says i will accept you with your sweet savior and i will bring you out of the people and gather you out of the countries wherein you have been scattered and i will be sanctified in you before the heathen so this is you know what the scripture was referring to when it says that no man can boast we can't really say that we are responsible for this happening to us we can't say we were such and such and that's the reason why you know the father reached in and pulled us out we know he had to come pull us out but why did he pull us out um we can't really take credit for that at all Verse 42 says, and ye shall know that I am the Lord when I shall bring you into the land of Israel, into the country for the which I lifted up my hand to give it to your fathers. Now, this is where some people get the idea that we're going back to Egypt. This ain't the only verse back to Israel, I should say. This ain't the only time it says that. Um, but I don't really know unless it's going to be after the day of the Lord. Maybe sure, you know, then you could go back. But there's no way that you could get me to go back over there before the day of the Lord. Because I'm looking at scripture that seems 
wants to say something like, you know, there's going to be a huge rock that's going to land over there on Mount Olive. And it's to be going to wreak havoc, if not completely destroy that part of the world, or at least Jerusalem as we know it. 43 says, and there shall ye remember your ways and all your doings, wherein ye have been defiled, and ye shall loathe yourselves in your own sight for all your evils that ye have committed. Okay, so now we can start comparing some of this to what we read about in the Shepherd of Hermas and the Angel of Punishment. Because after you spend a period of time um, making up for the wrongs that we've done, you finally start to get a repentant heart and you understand everything that you've gone through was the result of previous sins. And that's what it seems that it's talking about here where it starts saying you will loathe yourselves. Another idea that pops in is, you know, where it you know, talks about the Great Awakening and you have these people who awaken some to shame and some to remorse. So that could be what it's talking about here. Uh, verse 44 says, And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I have wrought with you for my namesake, not according to your wicked ways, nor according to your corrupt doings, O house of Israel, saith the Lord God. So he's coming for us. That's the beauty of this all is, you know, that, I mean, this is why some people talk about predestination, like, you know, you're minding your own business, but you're predestined to go through this. So there's nothing really you can, you know, do about it. When that day comes, you're going to take action and you're going to do exactly what he wants you to do. Well, I don't know that this applies to everybody. I don't, I don't know if I fit in that camp that says, you know, everybody's on this certain path, but to think many of us are still making mistakes and errors but yet he's chosen us over other people who you know seem to be wrecking really really hard to you know learn his ways seem to be overlooked sometime maybe I, I may not have seen it firsthand so let's go on verse 45 says moreover the word of the lord came unto me saying son of man set thy face toward the south and drop thy word toward the south and prophesy against the force of the south field now so this is some more of this Hermans kind of stuff we kind of need the shepherd of Hermans to understand here like we were talking about those mountains earlier now he's going to start talking about trees here and in the shepherd of Hermans one of the things we learn when it comes to you know the parables of the trees is how these certain trees are burned and in a different parable you have these other trees that are blossoming and bearing fruit but anyway may give you guys links to that which you can check at the end of the video for that playlist on the uh, Shepherd of Hermes um, it's a verse by verse kind of like we're doing now except for my wife helped me with it and we or I helped her with it and it covers the entire book called the Shepherd of Hermes like I said verse by verse but anyway check that out we're going to look at verse 47, which says, And say to the forest of the south, Hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will kindle a fire in thee, and it shall devour every green tree in thee, and every dry tree. The flaming flame shall not be quenched, and all faces from the south to the north shall be burned therein. This is what happens to trees that don't bear fruit. They get burned. Verse 48 says, And all flesh shall see that I, the Lord, have kindled it. It shall not be quenched. And so that's when Ezekiel speaks up and says, I, Lord God, they say of me, Thus he not speak parables. So this is kind of what reminded me of that parable. And maybe that's what's going on with verse 47. All right, so there you have it, guys. Ezekiel chapter 20. Um, as I was walking over here to close out this video, I was thinking, you know, all of the holidays have significance. Like we've been talking about the way and Passover and how that cleanses you. And then you have the Feast of Unleavened Bread when you actually get into the Word of God for a week, you know, 
You can imagine how much that gut that does for you. And then you have tabernacles where you're sleeping in a tent and, you know, giving you that secure feeling that it is our father who takes care of us and such. And then you have other festivals to do this and you have other festivals to do that. Well, this, in my memory, seems to be the only one that really focuses in on idolatry and maybe even the Sabbath day. You know, seems like those two are the focus of Ezekiel 20, and it's all talking about the 10th day of the fifth month, uh, like we read about in the first verse. But to me, it seems like this day, this could be the one day when we understand this, at least, you know, it could be the, the, the day annually where maybe we go through our house and make sure that we have no idolatrous stuff hidden around here or, you know, there. Um, getting, you know, that stuff at least where it's not, you know, seen. I, I usually take pictures and put them in a photo album or something like that, but I have burned them and destroyed them. So, but anyway, we wanted to cover every verse in this chapter, and I believe we have done so. I hope you got something out of this video. If you did, go ahead and hit the like button. If you didn't, hit the dislike button. Remember all your comments. Go ahead and watch the video again so you can see some of those links we were talking about. Um, but remember, all of this is making a connection. You know, if we were to try to summarize these connections, and y'all can help me out with this in the comment section. But what I believe he's saying is the tenth of Av is related to this exit of Babylon, this futuristic exit that we hear about, maybe even the Great Awakening. So with that, I'm going to close this video out, and I'm going to say shalom.